Most of your visions are too small because you're operating on past data. You're not operating on imagination and what you're capable of. You're pigeonholing yourself with your identity. This is why, uh, you know, last night I had a couple conversations, actually three different conversations where people introduced themselves to me as a solo. Anyone was one of those people in the room? Don't worry, you don't have to raise your hand. I don't tolerate that as an identity. I, uh, that would be like, the, when, when I started my business, that would be like me calling myself an inexperienced entrepreneur to everyone I introduced myself to. Hi, I'm Bill, <laughs> I'm an inexperienced entrepreneur. No, when I was like cold calling attorneys when I started SMB team and like scrapping for my life, I was like, man, we're gonna build the biggest company ever to, to dominate the legal industry. We're gonna do the best blah, blah, blah ever. We're gonna innovate a whole new way of growing law firms. Cause that's where my identity was. Now my reality, it took time to catch up to that, right? But my identity is always a, a step ahead of reality, right? So you got a choice. You can act the identity of who you are now, or you can start being your next identity, your choice. It's a lot easier to just start being the identity of who you are. Like, when I gave up doing client work, it was this quick of a decision. Why? My vision was big. I, there's absolutely no way I can do client work if I want to have this big of an impact. Done. Next. Who do I need to hire? How do I need to train them? And do you think things went perfectly right when I hired that person? No. They made mistakes. They misspelled things. It's my first employee at SMB Team. Right? Did I go back to being a solo or an inexperienced entrepreneur? No. Dude, we're going here. Let's hire someone else. Let's train someone else. Let's create a new process. Right? I'm not relenting on my vision. Right? Next thing I had to give up was intake or sales. Anyone here think I was good at sales? Yeah. Basically like 100% close rate when I was on the phone with someone. And I had to give that up. Oh, come on, Bill. Can't you just do a little more sales calls? No. I have to be CEO. I had to shed the identity of being a salesperson, shed the identity of being a client work person to become a CEO. It wasn't comfortable. I had to go into uncharted territory, areas where I wasn't as skilled, right? But again, the vision was big enough to do that. When you have a small vision, you spend your time in two areas, small problems and excuses. Brian Tracy calls it excusitis. Small vision, you're gonna spend your entire week and month and therefore quarter and therefore year solving small problems and excuses. Am I hitting a chord with anyone? Has anyone this week spent time on two small problems? Raise hands. Well, how am I gonna replace this one person? I'm thinking of what's our next 10 key hires and how am I gonna poach them from a competitor, right? Uh, small problem, this one $1,000 we spent on this thing didn't work. And I'm thinking, what's our next $100,000 investment? I'm thinking, actually, my number one, the biggest problem this quarter, because we have 15 salespeople now, is underspending on budget. That's, our, that's like our number one problem, is underspending on budget right now, in turn, on the growth side, not the operation side of the business. So I had to reset a whole team's KPIs around hitting our, team, hitting our ad spend budget. I am begging my team to spend $400,000 a month on ads. Uh, what, 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 what new funnels do we have to create? What new lead magus do we have to create? Uh, uh, how can we spend $400,000 a month is a real problem on ads. That's separate from the other $400,000 a month we have in marketing salaries or marketing and sales salaries. It's just different problems, 
right? Because my vision requires me to solve bigger problems. I don't have time to focus on little, you know, thinking about a tiny little $5,000 a month decision, which is compared to where I'm going. Small problems come from small vision. You will let go of every small problem that pops up in your law firm if you infect yourself with a bigger vision. You just won't have time to focus on them. So focus on big problems, right? And be aware of the excuses that you have. Right? Your excuses are a sign of how attached you are to your vision. Your excuses that you repetitively use are a sign of how attached you are to your vision. If you're not too attached to it, you'll, you'll tolerate excuses. Job market's hard. Oh, my market's different. My practice area is different. My, uh, it's too competitive here. It's not competitive enough here. Not enough uh, geo, uh, not enough people in my geography. Uh, too many competitors, you know, too few demand. Just excuses. So, what are some examples of excuses? Let's break down the, I can't hire people, the job market's hard. Why do you ever let those words ever even go through your mind, let alone your vocal passage? Eight billion people on planet Earth, figure it the hell out. <laughs> Poach people, reach out to people, improve your job ads. Your choice. You could walk around with this silent belief that the job market's hard everywhere you go, tail between your legs, And meanwhile, there's a dominator in your market gobbling up all the great people because that's not their belief, right? Right, marketing is hard. Marketing doesn't work. I can't spend X a month. I can go back and meet. Right, you heard that. Well, I can't get it to do it. Yep, that's, a, that's an excuse. I can't comes before any excuse. It does. So, like, reverse these things in your mind. Like, what if your every excuse you had that ever floated through your mind, you just reverse it? So what I call turning your list of limits into your transformation agenda. So list of limits, job market's hard. How do you switch job market's hard to how can I make the job market like shooting fish in a barrel, the easiest thing ever? And then force yourself to answer that question. When I interviewed Brian Tracy, he, he said, like, this is so simple in terms of like all of his theories. Write 15 answers to a question you can't answer. Write 15 answers to a question you can't answer. So cool, right? The job market's hard. How can I make the job market so dang easy? Force yourself to write 15 answers to it. How can I spend and then 10x your marketing budget? How much are you spending on marketing right now? Put a zero on it and force yourself to answer it 15 different ways. How could I hire 15 people in two months? Ooh, man, we're getting to a cool place here, huh? Ooh, we're hitting growth. Right? Not comfortable. This is foreign territory. We prevent ourselves from going down this area. So you can try this exercise for yourself, right? 
Uh, how can I not work more than 20 hours a week on the law firm? Force yourself to answer it 15 ways. How could I find three A player attorneys in less than 60 days? Whatever problem you're experiencing, turn it into a how can I statement. Force yourself to answer it 15 ways. It is like magic, magic doing this. When I'm brainstorming now, thinking about where we're going to bring SMB team, I literally use this for every single question that I have. Now, this is not just, we don't just want this to be an exercise. We want this to be your identity. That's the ultimate goal. You're so infected by the vision that you're just naturally always asking yourself, how can I questions? And naturally, you're in the shower, you're on the toilet, you're standing in line, and naturally, in all these situations, your brain is on just humming with those 15 answers to 10, 20 different types of those questions constantly. That's where imagination comes from. That's where unstoppable momentum comes from. You're just constantly like, how could I do this? How could I do this? How could I do this? Right? So when you have a searing vision, it's going to eliminate excuses. And that's powerful in and of itself. Because when you're not living with excuses, first of all, excuses is victim. So when you have an excuse, whenever you say, I can't do X because, and it's always around something, I'm different, I'm unique, my situation's unique, that's what an excuse, that's, that's the telltale sign of an excuse, you're going to call yourself what it is. I'm a victim. I'm being a victim right now. Stop. You get what you tolerate. If you tolerate working 80-hour weeks, you'll get that. If you tolerate only running your law firm through an executive team so that you don't have to work more than 20 hours a week, you'll get that. If you tolerate C players on your team, you'll get C performance, C outputs. You get what you tolerate. And what you tolerate is a reflection of your excuses and what you've made sense of. Sell or be sold. Either you're making a sale or you're being sold in 100% of circumstances. Sell or be sold. A prospect hops on the phone with your team and says, I need to think about it. Either you're going to sell them. You talked about this, right? Either you're going to sell them on making a decision or they're going to sell you on why they need to think about it. Either way, someone's being sold. So either you're selling or you're being sold. Same thing happens with your belief system. Either you're selling yourself on the identity you want, or you're being sold by the cultural, societal, hypnotic mechanism, i.e., the majority of public are, the majority of people in public are broke and are not happy with their lives and are actively disengaged with their work. And that is a hypnosis spell that society imposes on the majority of people, which is why the majority of people are like that. Are you going to be sold by that? Or are you going to sell everyone in your environment on a different belief system? Even if you're the only one speaking that way for some time, and it feels uncomfortable and awkward and weird that you're the most positive person in your circle, eventually, sell or be sold will kick in. If you persist long enough, everyone around you will go, I guess that's Otis, right? Guess that's Lance. Guess that's Marco, you know? This is a real thing. Most times when people first encounter my energy, 
they think, is this real? Is this sustained? Right? And, you know, then over time, you realize, yeah, it's actually sustained because this is my identity. Right? So it eliminates excuses. A searing vision, Deidre, a searing vision forces you to delegate. Forces you to delegate. Write this down. Please, please, pretty please write this down. A searing vision forces you to delegate. The stuff that you're doing now that is below your pay grade, you just give it up. How do I give it up? What's the right time? How do I train someone on it? All those excuses float away. You just decide. By X date, I am no longer doing this role in my firm. And by Y date, I'm no longer doing this role in my firm. And by Z date, I'm no longer doing this role in my law firm. So it's very simple. It's decide and then actually do it. And then the bonus step is never go backwards, ever. Once you stop doing something, never, ever go backwards. I gave up a little bit of casework once. It didn't work. I'm going to go back to it. Prevent yourself from ever going backwards on a task that you gave up or a responsibility that you gave up in your firm. Big vision forces you to do that. I could bring you through a million and one things I did in SMB team that I now no longer do that were so scary in the moment. Building uh, PPC campaigns, which is what I did for my first two years or a year and a half in SMB team. That was so scary. That's your version of giving up the client work, right? <laughs> giving up sales calls. Oh, it was so scary. Never went backwards. Amen. Right? Uh, giving up hiring. Woo, man, that was scary. Oh, I need to have that final CEO sniff test. I got to come in there and just do that, work that magic, because I'm special. I can't scale my, my interview questions for the third round. No, it, it's happened. It's actually better. I actually found out I suck at hiring. I made all the worst hiring decisions in our company. Now, I also made some good ones. Made some good ones, okay? But the majority of the bad ones were made by me. H- giving up hiring? Oh, man, giving up budgeting? Woo! When I started doing detailed budgeting for SMB team, I was like, oh, man, this controls our whole financial ecosystem as a company. Gave that up. I have given up literally everything but opportunity creation which is now, like, I literally show up to work every day with, like I've told you guys a million times, an empty calendar. That doesn't mean I don't do anything throughout the day. That means I am, I'm in a, a creative problem-solving state every day. I have this pulse on what our company's top three KPIs are. I have this pulse on what the problems popping up are. I do some skip-level meetings. I inspect what I expect. I do these skip levels, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll meet with members of the team, I'll take notes, I'll do my own research, I'll do some analysis, I'll come up with some ideas on how we can solve this problem, different ways that we can uh, p- uh, pounce on this opportunity, boom, I start coming up with a Last strategic one. plan. Last one. Hey, we have someone's mic on in, in the back. Come up with a strategic plan, then I'll brief some of the relevant parties on that strategic plan, uh, I help us set quarterly goals at the beginning of the year. I'm, I'm just like a, I'm like a free agent now for SMB team. I, I, like creative problem solver is what I would, if my, my real job title is creative problem solver right now. And opportunity pouncer. So, but that's because I gave up everything else. So now I can do that. Now I can focus on what's our next three big moves. What's our, what's our next big multi hundred thousand dollar decision? right? Big vision forces you to delegate. Big vision forces you, number three, to hire. 
forces you to hire before you're ready, right? Big vision forces you to spend more money on marketing. So if you don't feel forced, literally you feel every morning like there's a gun to your head and you must spend more money on marketing, I must hire people, I must delegate more, then again, it's lack of attachment to vision. Your vision isn't, it's not, it's not screaming from within you, right? So then the question is, how do we solve that? We have to set something that's big. Now, big doesn't mean just revenues. It means whatever the heck you decide big is, but it has to feel unachievable. It has to feel this is a little unrealistic. Otherwise, it's not a vision. It's a prediction. Prediction is not exciting, right? You need to feel like, I can't really solve this. That's exciting. That's where you enter what's called the infinite game. I am in love with the game. I love the problems that pop up every single week. Just like Vic was saying, bring me problems, please. Bring me as many problems as you possibly can. Because those problems are the evidence that I'm gonna use to create a plan to go closer to that vision. Bring me the problems. Now, here's the key. I'm not gonna go in and solve the problems. I'm gonna innovate and strategize around the problems to come up with a plan that prevents those problems in the future. I'm not gonna go personally solve the problem. So this requires detachment. I'm gonna analyze problems from a distance. I'm gonna data aggregate problems. If one client complains about one thing one time, that's not data. That's not data aggregated feedback. I need to know that 15 clients had a similar problem. Right? Okay, now this is an area where Bill can actually innovate some strategy time. If one client has a problem with one thing, the default mode is let me go solve that problem right now. Stop doing that, that's a, that's a $10 an hour task. You can do that, but that's preventing you from the CEO level thinking, right? So, this is why the vivid vision is so important. If we look up here, so this is SMB Team's Vivid Vision. You guys have probably seen this before. It's on our website. This is my identity. This is not just words on a PDF phrase. This is what, the reason we force people to read this, I'm gonna show you all of our different slides for this. This is the opening slide. Core values clearly explains our culture, clearly explains our core belief as a company, clearly explains our mission clearly explains our exact financial targets, explains our core business activities, the key pillars behind each business activity, our marketing, our coaching, our wow client experience team, our uh, attorney assistant, our sales and marketing dynasty and what that actually means, and the long term. This is what we force 100% of people to read in our interview process. Right? I want to scare you away in our interview process. I want you to feel exposed when you read this, that if you're looking to punch in, punch out, you, you eject yourself from our interview process and say, nope, this isn't a fit for me. I only want people who are like, hell yeah, when they read this. That's why after the screening interview, 100% of people have to read this and they have to make a 60 to 90 second video on how they intend on helping this vivid vision come true. Nobody is too good for this. I don't care what level role it is. I don't care, I, I always say this, and I'm gonna say it again. Like, there is no, uh, say you're hiring a really high level attorney, and you feel like, oh, if I force them through this process, maybe I'll scare them away. 
Remove that thought from your beliefs. You want to scare them away. You want to vet people in your interview process as to whether or not they're willing to follow an additional step. This is not just your recruiting document. This is your culture document for your internal team. This is what holds you, the CEO, accountable. Everyone else on your team has roles and responsibilities. What's your role and responsibility? It's this. So are you going to have your team be held to high standards and then you're held to nothing, no standards at all? Is that fair? No, this is how CEOs get held accountable. Here's where we're going in the next three years. Right? Put it out in the open. You don't have to reach everything in this. Shoot for the stars, you're gonna land somewhere in outer space, right? So, I, again, I've, I've said this for years and years and years, 100% of you must have a PDF version of where you are going. Otherwise, you're just hoping that your team knows where you want to go and what you stand for. Through conversation. Document it. Make it public. And it should scare the shit out of yourself when you make this public. So, once we start putting out our vision, this is why we invented the Lawyer Legacy Staircase, which is a big principle within our book, you're able to rise to that law firm CEO, law firm owner level, right? Remember, when you are at the bottom half below the abyss, when you're a solo practitioner or a small business manager with three to 19 employees, which is small business manager, most times you are not working for yourself. Like, when we go into entrepreneurship, we say, oh, I work for myself. No, it's not true. You're on call for a small team and your clients when you're below the line. When you're above the line, when you become a CEO, you work for a leadership team and a vision. If you don't have either of those two things, you are not a CEO. If you don't have a leadership team and you don't have a vision, you are not a CEO. Once you become an active managing CEO of your law firm, like just like I said before, you have to force yourself to delegate, right? You, when you're active CEO, you're still in the day-to-day -day of your law firm. So this is when you need to hire a COO or a CEO to then run the day-to-day -day of your business so that you can do whatever the hell you want, right? And then that opens you up to be the owner category. Owner category is where you, your law firm runs with or without you. That's the owner category. Now you can choose whatever you want to do with the owner category. Owner category then opens you up to be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is a duplicated business model, right? So once you have proven how to create one self-sustaining business, very easy to duplicate that across different geographies, practice areas, very quickly. It might have taken you 10 years to create a firm that runs itself, but then if you want to duplicate your business model in another market, it may only take one year to do that and to get to the same revenues it took you 10 years to get to. That's entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is a proven business model, scaled. Now, once you get to owner level, now remember, it works with or without you. If you like doing casework, you can still do casework, but you can now just do the exact cases you choose. Right? Doesn't mean you must not do casework when you're an owner. It means freedom of choice. You choose what to work on every day. But you don't need to work on anything. You're choosing to work on it. Because you have a team that can handle the things that you choose not to work on, right? Freedom entrepreneur. Now, you can choose to expand a proven business model, or you can choose to do freedom entrepreneur. But you literally step away from the firm, it runs itself, and you either sell it, or you, and, or you, create a, you receive a cash dividend from the firm that runs itself. That's freedom entrepreneur. You can do whatever you want. You can be a fly fisherman, which we talked about, Misha, right? Um, yep. 
Do whatever the hell you want once you reach the owner category. You can go for freedom or you can go for scale and dominate, which again, we write about in the book, which then gets you to level eight, which almost nobody gets to, which is wealth multiplier, where your money makes you more money, not your time. Angel investor, whatever. So there's levels to this game, right? Understanding those top four levels, levels five through eight, is exciting. Because now you know when you give up the day-to-day, this is where you're going to be. It's not just like an abyss. Oh, if I give up what I'm doing now, I'm going to have an identity crisis. No, you're going to have an identity awakening. That's exciting. Look at these other amazing levels that exist, right? Now, the only way that you climb the lawyer legacy staircase is through the law firm growth acceleration model, which is why our book is called Law Firm Growth Accelerator. There's only four inputs. Do I have everyone's attention? I'm going to speed through the math here. There's only four inputs. It's actually five inputs, because you'll see why in a second. Everyone ready? Let's go through lead generation first. Input number one, leads per month. If you increase the number of leads you're getting per month by 100, input number two, ready? You convert 20% of those 100 additional leads. That's input number two. You will sign up 20 new cases a month. Now, there's ifs embedded in there, right? Okay, great. You get 20 new cases a month. If your average case value is 5,000, which Lance would say, raise that, right? Then you would be bringing on $100,000 a month in additional revenue. This isn't like optional, this is math, this is fact. So what are the three inputs that we just went through here? Number of leads, conversion rate, average case value. That's what we call the revenue growth formula, okay? All right. So boom, now you've solved the bottom two rungs of the law firm growth acceleration model. Now let's solve the top two. Once you bring in an extra $100,000 a month in revenue, now you can play with these numbers and make it way bigger than this puny $100,000 a month number I put up here. But hire five new A players. Once you hire five new A players, you create a 20% profit plan altogether. That gives you freedom and an additional $240,000 a year in profits. What does that mean? This is how you grow your revenue, and this is how you grow your freedom, and this is how you grow your profits. Very simple. It's just math. Increase your leads, increase your conversion rate, increase your average case value, hire five A players to handle the increased caseload, create a 20% profit plan budget so that you're profiting 20% along the way. Very simple. It's just math. Right? So, what you're going to be doing today is setting goals around these five numbers. So, in a little bit, you're going to be setting some of your quarterly goals. This is my battle cry and wish for everyone, okay? If the goals you set are not within these categories, they are a distraction. If you are not setting goals around increasing your lead volume, now, not all of you need to do that. Some of you need to, some of you don't. Some of you already have plenty of leads, which leads to option number two. You need to set goals around increasing your conversion rate. Okay, maybe some of you don't need to do that. Maybe your intake and your lead generation is perfectly fine. You don't need any improvements in those two areas. Is that true for anyone? Okay, well, you probably need to set goals around those two areas. Something around lead generation, something around intake conversion rate. Something around number three, case value. You just double your average case value, you double your revenues. And you probably double your profits. Actually, you probably triple your profits, right? So you're probably going to set a goal today around lead generation, intake, average case value, or 
you're going to set one around. Now, we don't like to set goals around hiring because that, if you set a quarterly goal around hiring and you don't find the right person that quarter, it, it forces you to hire the wrong person just to hit your quarterly goal. But you are going to set recruiting-based goals, something like, hey, I want to interview five A-player attorneys by X date. Don't set hiring as a quarterly goal when we go through our quarterly goal setting process because it forces you to make the wrong decisions. And you're going to set a profit goal. How many of you have grown revenues and seen profits go down? Raise of hands. Yeah, it's one of the most common things that clients experience when they experience the growth of working with us is they grow their top line revenues, but their profits go down. Greatest way to learn how important profit is is to not profit for a couple months. Right? Now, I, I could save you that worry, which I've been through, Mark's been through, you know, Derek's been through, a lot of us have been through who have been in the program for a while. Just demand profits and growth now. I'll save you all the concerns. Demand profits and growth. That requires discipline. Budgeting discipline. So you're going to do something around your lead generation when you set goals today, something around your conversion rate, something around your average case value, something around high, mm, not hiring, interviewing a certain number of A players for a specific role or a couple of roles, expanding your team, and something around demanding X amount of profit, right? Now, in our book, we break this down. I'm not going to go in, in, in the weeds here. But those four prongs I just broke down, lead generation, intake, team, and profits, there are levels to the game in terms of where owners spend their time and doers do their, spend their time. When you are a solo practitioner, you are the rainmaker. If I go from left to right, you are the sole rainmaker. You're the one generating new opportunities through word of mouth and referral. Go to the next one. You are the one doing intake. You are the one doing the work because you don't have a team. You are the one with, you don't have a financial plan. Therefore, your hourly rate is the lowest it could possibly be. As you rise up the lawyer legacy staircase, your hourly rate increases. You start spending time on higher value things, right? At the highest level, when you are an owner, you're focused on big picture marketing initiatives, omnipresence. You're focused on your sales process and who you're gonna hire as a sales leader. You're focused on imagining the next opportunity is not doing any day-to-day -day work. You're focused on your annual planning process rather than reactive profit planning and adjustments. Your, your focus becomes more long-term and more important. Everyone know about the urgency and importance scale? Oftentimes, the things that are urgent are not the most important. Now, there are times where high urgency, high importance items pop up, but oftentimes, the most urgent items are not the most important. When you are a CEO owner, you're only spending time on the important, almost none of the urgent. Your team is handling all the urgent. And hopefully, the processes you have in your firm are making it so that things aren't ever urgent. They're always done proactively. Right? So there's levels to the game is my point. Now our methodology that we teach is this. And I'll summarize this quickly before we go into our breakout. This is our methodology. This is the methodology that allowed our company to scale as fast as we did. I'm gonna to go top to bottom. Everyone with me? Top left, vision and conviction. Do you know exactly where you're going in three years and do you have personal conviction behind that? Are you emotionally anchored to it? Next one, values, your core values. Do you have operating behaviors that have been made clear to your team as to what behavior 
is accepted in your law firm, i.e. your core values? Number three, do you have an annual plan taking that three-year vision and putting it into where exactly you will be in the next 12 months financially? Okay, check, 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 check. Now we've got the top row. Let's go top left on the strategy row. Do you have quarterly boulders, which you're gonna be setting today? Do you have quarterly boulders, quarterly goals, that clearly articulate where you will be in the next three months? Are they documented? Are they stored in one place? Have you presented these boulders to your team in a PowerPoint presentation at the beginning of the quarter, which the beginning of the quarter is happening in just a couple days, right? And are you getting weekly reports throughout the quarter from your team as to the status of those goals? Boom, check, now we've solved quarterly boulder. Now, like Vic said, this is a multi, multi, multi-quarter year process to dial this in. When you first set quarterly goals, you're gonna set too big a goals, too small a goals, under project, over project. Great, that's all data for you to become a sharper CEO next time, right? You're never gonna get it perfect. Second, strategic planning. This is how you accomplish your boulders, right? Uh, you could set, again, the five areas to set goals around quarterly boulders. I need everyone to repeat after me so I know you heard me. Number one, lead generation. Intake. Average case value. Interviewing X number of A players. 20 to 30% profit plan. Good, okay. That's where you're setting quarterly boulders around. Then your strategic plan is how you accomplish that. So we wanna go from 200 leads a month to 300 leads a month. Your strategic plan is how we're gonna do that. So it's just a one-page document of, we're gonna analyze our Google budget, we're gonna meet with our rep and determine which keyword groups are operating the best, we're gonna launch a new Facebook ads campaign for this specific area of law, we're gonna put this budget behind it, we're gonna blah, 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 blah. Okay, great, check, now I have a plan for increasing my leads. That's strategic plan, right? Then we need a numbers plan to back it all up, right? Just call this a scorecard. This is your company scorecard. This is how you measure success. Company scorecard. Now you have a financial company scorecard, you have a uh, company and department scorecard, you have incentive scorecard, we don't need to go into that yet. All I need you to do is have a one-page document that shows what, what are the top 10 to 15 numbers in the firm and track them. That's it. That's your company scorecard. That's your numbers plan. So let's summarize this. Make this super simple. Oh, here, here's another tip for everyone. How many of you feel like you're a little bit behind when, when you see all this information? Raise your hand. Feel like you don't have all this rolled out. Okay. You kind of feel like you want to be there but you're here right now, right? Can everyone do a favor? Cancel the word there from your vocabulary. I really don't feel like I'm there yet. I'm not there yet, I don't have this stuff yet. Dude, you are here now. Be here now, right? Everything else is a bonus. Overwhelm comes from you wanting to be there but being here. Cancel the word there from your vocabulary. You are here now. You're already there. Every step you take, oh cool, I'm at a new there. I'm at a new here, right? All this stuff is one step at a time. When you feel overwhelmed, it's just the next step. It's just the next step. You, it's impossible to feel overwhelmed when you are one step, one step, one step. When you look at 15,000 steps in front of you, yeah, it's overwhelmed, paralysis by analysis. Don't focus on that. Focus on one step. What's within my control in the next 24 hours, and let's do that right now. Impossible to feel overwhelmed in that state. Execution. Three ways you execute. Project plan. Okay, when you, when you create a strategic plan on how you're gonna go from 100 to 300 leads a month or whatever, 
Your project plan is, okay, there's five projects within this. Project number one is my Google plan. Project number two is my Facebook plan. Project number three is my offline plan. That's it. You take a big mountain and you turn it into three tiny little projects. Very simple. That's project planning. Next is what are your EOPs? What are your ongoing processes for either processing cases, handling intake, etc.? That's your EOPs. What are your processes? So let's recap. The two ways that you execute that we've gone through thus far, once you've set at the high level, you've set a clear quarterly goal. You have a strategy behind that goal and you have numbers to track that goal. Everyone tracking? I'm gonna say it again. I need everyone to say yes if you're tracking, okay? You set a clear quarterly goal, a clear strategy on how you're gonna reach that goal and numbers to track that goal. Yes? Okay. Once you have that, then the way you execute the day-to-day -day of your law firm or a project is do a project plan. Stand, what people call standard operating procedures. We call excellence operating procedures. But your procedures is the second way that you execute things. And the third way that you execute things is through other people, which is meetings what we call agendaed meetings, right? This is where you delegate things to people. If you don't have meetings, you can't delegate to people. The only way that you delegate things to people is through written or spoken word, right? So once you know what has to happen in your law firm, the next step is to meet with someone so they can do it, not you. That's what a meeting does. Very simple. Then we need a process for self-leadership, and then we need a process for keeping our team dialed in, happy, and aligned. And that's what team mastery is at the bottom. How do we lead ourselves? How do we lead others? We lead ourselves through being a role model leader, doing of ourselves what we expect of our team, way more than what we expect of our team for ourselves. And then team mastery is how do you hold people accountable through organizational charts? How do you hold people accountable through employee scorecards where they all, everyone on your team knows the three numbers that they're held accountable for and they're bonused on it and they're, they maintain employment based on it if they reach the numbers, right? How do you recruit people? How do you train people? How do you onboard people? And how do you put people on a performance improvement plan or terminate them. Termination policies are important. And be public about them. I would say your termination policies in your interview process. Remember, scare them away. If you do not reach these three numbers, we're gonna part ways. How's that sound to you? Oh, yeah, no problem, I'm an A player. I know I'm gonna crush those three numbers. Great. That's the process. That's how you reach your revenue, profit, and freedom goals. 